Hello, I'm Roger Rush, minister for the 6th and Washington Street's Church of Christ in Marietta, Ohio. And I'll be speaking to you at this time. Our text will come from Romans chapter 8. At the outset, let me encourage you to get your Bible, open it to the 8th chapter of the Roman letter, and be prepared to follow along as we read the introductory text in a few moments. As I record this, we are still under a stay-at-home order here in the state of Ohio. I, like you, I suspect, am looking forward to that order being rescinded, and in a short time, we hope, we'll be able to assemble again on the corner of 6th and Washington Streets. We meet when it is permissible each Lord's Day at 9 for our Bible school, at 10 for our morning worship, and at 6.30 for our evening assembly. We also have a midweek service on Wednesday evening beginning at 7. And I would like to encourage you at the outset, if you can, to join us as soon as we can resume our times together to worship God in spirit and in truth as we're directed to do in the Word of God. Today's message, as I said, comes from Romans chapter 8. I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but I will tell you it is one of the most hope-filled texts in the New Testament. I'm going to select a couple of uh, verses and then read the conclusion of the 8th chapter as an introduction to our study. I want to begin with Romans 8 and verse 18. Paul said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Then in verse 28, he said, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. And then concluding the 8th chapter, beginning in verse 31, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a powerful statement, hope-filled statement for people of God. You know, as a youngster, it was quite common to choose sides and play games while in school. Everyone had a pretty good grasp of who the better athletes were, and we always wanted to be chosen to be on their team. Why was that? Because all of us like to win. Well, that doesn't always happen in life. There are always winners and losers, and as surely as someone has to win, someone has to lose. But when it comes to our relationship with God through Christ, we can all be winners, more than conquerors through Him that loved us. What a marvelous thought. As a Christian, we're on the winning side. We may face minor skirmishes, and it may sometimes look like we've lost the battle, but we know the outcome of the war, ultimately, we really do win. And knowing that, we can face whatever the devil throws our way. And that seems to be the message that Paul was conveying to the saints at Rome. I thought I'd begin our study today with, with a story that I read many years ago. I'll try to make it brief as an introduction. According to the story, a missionary was sitting in a second-story window when he was handed a letter from home. As he opened it, a crisp $10 bill fell out. He was 
pleasantly surprised, but as he read the letter, his eyes were distracted by the movement of a shabbily dressed stranger down below. He couldn't get him off his mind. Thinking that the stranger might be in greater financial need than he, he slipped the bill into an envelope on which he quickly penned, Don't Despair. He then tossed it out the window. The stranger below picked it up, looked up, and smiled as he tipped his hat and went on his way. The next day, he was about to leave the house the missionary was, when a knock came at the door. He found the same shabbily dressed man smiling as he handed the gentleman a roll of bills. When he asked what they were for, the stranger replied, That's the 60 bucks you won, mister. Don't despair. Paid five to one. Now, obviously, don't despair is not the name of a horse today, but it is the title of our message. I know of no passage, as I said a moment ago, which offers greater hope to God's people than the one that we shared a moment ago. In that text, in Romans 8, Paul reminds us all that we are loved unconditionally. Nothing and no one can stop the Father from loving His children. No matter how bleak the picture, how low we sink, how heavy our load may be, He will always be there. And in the, in the end, our faith will be vindicated. It's never hopeless for God's people. A poet has written, Could we with ink the ocean fill, Were every blade of grass a quill, Were all the world a parchment made, And every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above Would drain the ocean dry, Nor could the scroll contain the whole, Though stretched from sky to sky. The Bible is filled with affirmations of God's love. I don't even need to quote John 3.16. I suspect all of you already know it by heart. In Romans 5, verse 8, Paul had written, God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And in 1 John 4.16, John simply exclaims, God is love. But God does not merely tell us of His love. He shows us in a powerful way. When I think of the love of God and the demonstration of that love in the person of Jesus, as a Bible student, I immediately go to 1 John. Three passages just kind of jump off the pages to me. I'll read them in reverse order. Beginning in chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, John wrote, In this was manifested, or made known, the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. I follow that with 1 John three sixteen. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. A clear reference to the crucifixion of Jesus. And then in 1 John 3, verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. His love led Paul to ask certain hope-filled questions in our text today, in Romans chapter 8. Those questions are going to serve as the basis for the remainder of of our time together. There are just four of them. I'll highlight them and make some observations, and the lesson will be yours. We began in Romans 8, verse 31, with the question, who can be against us? And the simple message is, God's power is our protection. Here are some examples of what I mean. This is what Moses said to Israel, Leviticus 26, 7 and 8. And ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Now when the conquest finally began under the leadership of Joshua, Israel succeeded not because of greater numbers, not because they were better trained and equipped, but because 
God was with them. And Paul is saying to Christians who face struggles every day, do not despair. God is with you, and if God is with you, who can be against you? His power is our protection. I mentioned the conquest a moment ago. Here is Joshua to Israel, Joshua 23.10. One man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God, he it is that fighteth for you as he hath promised you. I've been disappointed during this pandemic at the great emphasis on science and how we need to trust in science. If they're right, and the virus came from a lab in Wuhan, scientists are responsible for it to begin with. Now, it's not that I'm opposed to science. It's not that I don't want to see a vaccine or a a remedy. The simple matter is that when it comes to trust, we need to be emphasizing our trust in God, not science. I wish the world would wake up to this revelation. When God is for us, who can be against us? When we're against God, we can't possibly succeed. But with God on our side, nothing is impossible. In the days of the United Kingdom, during the life of King Saul, the first king, Saul's son Jonathan made this statement to his armor-bearer before they took on a garrison of Philistines. It's found in 1 Samuel 14, 6. Jonathan said to his armor-bearer, Come, let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work with us, for there is no restraint with the Lord to say by many or by few. When it comes to choices in life, I don't want to choose what the majority chooses. I want to choose what God has chosen. I don't want to follow the crowd. I want to follow Christ. I want to be on the right side, the winning side, where the real power is found. Don't you? The psalmist said in Psalm 118, verse 6, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And you see a similar affirmation in Hebrews 13, verse 6. The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Again, who can be against us? If we are in Christ, God's power is our protection, Romans 8, 31. Then in verse 33, who can bring a charge against us? God's law is our sanctuary. Now, he's not saying that charges won't be leveled, but he is asserting that those charges will be false. If we are living by God's standard, if we are truly God's people, then our lives will be above reproach. Do you know that they could bring no honest charge against Jesus? In fact, when you look at John's record of the trial of Jesus, three times Pilate, the governor, said, I find no fault in this just person. You see, Jesus had lived his life not to please himself, but to please the Father. He had been guided by the law of God his entire life. Peter said he did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Yes, they leveled charges against him, but they were false charges, and men who made them were paid to lie. I would say the same is true for Christians today. Look at the example of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle was arrested in Jerusalem. Because of a plot to kill him, he was taken to Caesarea and ultimately had to appeal to Caesar and made his way to Rome. Festus, the governor, said, He hath committed nothing worthy of death, no certain thing to write. Agrippa and Festus both concluded, This man has done nothing worthy of death or bonds, Acts 25, 25, and 26, and 26, 31. Why was that so? Because he lived his life as a Christian. And as Christians, if people are honest and fair, they can only applaud men and women who live life governed by the principles of God's Word. They do right because it is right, and they avoid wrong because it is wrong. They seek to be governed by God's Word, and God's Word, God's law is a sanctuary for saints. No charge can be leveled honestly against those who abide in the Word. Peter makes that argument in 1 Peter 3.16 when he wrote, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, 
They may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation or conduct in Christ. When we are true children of God, God's law is our refuge, our sanctuary, and no honest charges can be leveled against us. You see, we can't go wrong when we follow the course that is right. The third question is found in verse 34. Who can condemn us? And here Paul asserts that God's grace is our salvation. Yes, there is a judgment coming. Jesus will be our judge, His word the basis of that judgment. In John 12, 48, Jesus said Himself, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word which I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. If we live our lives as Christians, we live our lives, as I said just a moment ago, governed by the law of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we'll hear our Master say in judgment, Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of your Lord. That's not because we live flawless, sinless, perfect lives, but because our Savior did that. And He died in our behalf. His sins washed away our sins. And thus, as His disciples, we stand in a unique situation. The Bible talks about Christians having their sins washed away. Acts 22, 16, Ananias said to Saul, Why do you tarry? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Earlier in the Roman epistle, in chapter 6, Paul likened the baptism of a believer as a reenactment of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, in which an old man is buried and a new man is raised to walk in newness of life, washed not by the water, but by the blood of the Lamb. Not only are we washed, we are sanctified. That is, we're set apart and made holy. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2, Paul wrote unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. If you're a Christian, you are a saint of God. You're set apart to live a godly life. In Titus 2, 11 and 12, the text says, The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That is, we live under God's rules, His standards, guided by His Word, and that His grace makes our salvation possible. Our sins are washed away by the blood of the Lamb at our baptism. We are set apart and made holy through the vicarious death of Jesus. We're also justified. Earlier in Romans, chapters 3, 23, and 24, that is chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, the apostle asserted all sin and come short of the glory of God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. We learn that in Romans 6, 23. Being justified freely, he said, by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In judgment, as a Christian, we will stand justified before the judge. Someone has said the best way to understand that word justification is to simply say, just as if I'd never sinned. And that is so true for children of God. We will also be forgiven, Colossians 1, verse 14, of Jesus in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And ultimately, because God's grace is our salvation and no one can condemn us, and Jesus will be our judge, our elder brother, our Savior, we will be saved. Mark 16, 16 contains the words of Jesus just prior to His ascension. You may recall in verse 15, he said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then in verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. If you've obeyed the gospel, if your faith has been demonstrated in repentance, confession, and immersion, upon your response to that gospel, the blood of Christ washed away your sins. The Lord added you to His church, Acts 2.47, he has written your name in the Lamb's book of life, and heaven is in your future. And there's nothing anyone, not even the devil, can do to blot your name out if you remain faithful, loyal, and true to the Master. And so, we say again, who can condemn us? No one when we are in Christ, because God's grace is our salvation.
We're washed, we're sanctified, we're justified, we're forgiven, and so. But there's one, one final question that wraps up our study. It's in verse 35. Who shall separate us? God's love is our bond, and it is an unbreakable bond if we remain loyal and true to Him. Not Satan, with all of his power, can overcome that bond because Satan's powers are limited. And the reality is, ladies and gentlemen, that at his core, he is a coward. James, the brother of our Lord, wrote in chapter 4 of his epistle, verse 7, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The devil cannot destroy our faith. He cannot separate the bond that we have with Christ. Only we can do that if we renounce him, fall from grace, turn away from our faith, and die apart from Jesus. Sin can't separate us. It has been conquered. In Romans 6, verse 7, Paul asserted of those who have been buried in a watery grave and raised to walk in newness of life, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, we've been freed from sin, meaning the condemnation of sin, as implied in Romans 8, verse 1. Suffering can't separate us from God. In fact, it's a a badge of honor. In 1 Peter 4, 13 and 16, Peter admonished Christians, Rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering. And then went on to say, If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf or in this name. It's striking to me that in the early days of the history of the church and the city of Jerusalem, those early disciples found themselves beaten and charged not to speak any more in the name of Christ. What was their response? The record says they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus, Acts 5, 41 and 42. Who can separate us when God's love is our bond? Not Satan, not sin, not suffering, not even space or distance. He... God is the ever-present one. There is nowhere we can go where He is not found. This is an assertion of the 139th Psalm, verses 7 through 14. Our lives are lived before Him at all times. But that's a good thing when we are His people. He's there for us at all times, in all situations. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And yes, we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man may do unto me. And finally, separation in death can't separate us from the love of God in Christ. You see, for Christians, the sting of death has been removed. In 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57, Paul wrote, O the death, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God that giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. He then went on to write, Be therefore steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So don't despair, my friend, in these difficult times. As this text clearly reveals, in Christ life is filled with hope. Who can be against us when God is for us? No one. God's power is our protection. Who can bring charge against us when we're God's people? No one, for God's love is our sanctuary. Who can condemn us when we are Christians? No one, for God's grace is our salvation. And who shall separate us? No one and nothing, for God's love is our bond. Is that true in your life? Are you a child of God? Are you walking in the steps of Jesus? Are you living here in preparation for the hereafter? Can you truly and honestly wear the name of Christ? You know, there are certain things that we must do to align our lives with the life of our Lord. And they're set forth in clear and precise language in the New Testament. Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. John 8, 24 
That's the reading of the American Standard Translation of 1901. The writer of Hebrews wrote, Without faith it's impossible to please him. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We believe that with all of our heart. And that's where many people want to stop. But what kind of faith is it that acknowledges the true identity of Christ and pays lip service but doesn't seek to obey him or walk in his steps? James chapter 2 calls that a dead faith, and a dead faith will not save. The kind of faith that is living is a faith that is demonstrated through repentance, which is a change in thinking that results in a change in action. And it was Jesus himself who said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Luke 13, 3 and 5. It's not by accident when at Pentecost they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter, the inspired apostle, replied, repent and be baptized. You have to change your thinking and your doing to be a true Christian. And some would stop there, but the scriptures do not. Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Romans 10, 9 and 10 tell us that we must confess our faith. And in John 12, 42, certain men who believed in Jesus would not confess him because they feared being cast out of the synagogue. They were more concerned with what others thought than what God thought. Do you think that's the kind of confession that is necessary? Well, of course not. That's not a confession at all. We have to have the courage of our conviction and acknowledge with our heart confidently that Jesus was the Christ. And some would say it stops there, but not the Scriptures. Our confession must be followed by a new birth. That's a burial in water and a resurrection to walk in newness of life. You see it played out graphically in Romans chapter 8 in the conversion of the Ethiopian nobleman. He's riding along in his chariot. He's joined by the evangelist Philip. He asked, do you understand what you read? And the man said, how can I accept some man should guide me? He didn't know whether the prophet spoke of himself or another. And Philip opened his mouth, began at the same scripture and preached unto Jesus. And as they're riding along, they came to water. And the man said, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Now I have to ask, why would he bring up the subject of baptism if the message was about Christ? Well, the fact is you can't preach Christ and ignore the new birth or baptism. The record says that he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he, Philip, baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that he saw him no more, and the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. Now, it's hard to misunderstand what unfolded there. Have you done what Batman needed to do and did to be a Christian, to share in the hope that all Christians have? and to live life knowing that we don't despair in Christ. We face the day as the psalmist did, saying, This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Psalm 118, 24. That's how Christians face every day. That's how we face life. That's how we deal with adversity. Because when God is for us, no one can be against us. Because when we are in Christ, no one can level a charge against us if we are living by God's rules. And who can condemn us? No one. And Jesus, ultimately our judge, is our elder brother and Savior, and heaven will be our future, for nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's the hope we offer to you based on God's word, because God loved you, Jesus died for you. Heaven can be your home. If we've said something today that's piqued your interest, if you'd like to study more, or if you're ready to obey the gospel, we'll find the time and place where we can sit down together, answer your questions from God's Word, and help you do what all of us must do to become children of God and to live in hope, not despair, to face the future confidently, knowing that no matter what, God still rules in the affairs of men. All is well in the universe, and all is well with us in Jesus Christ. Thank you for being with us again. We hope that you'll join us next time. Until then, may God bless you richly as you seek to know and do His holy will. This is Roger Rush for the 6th in Washington Streets Church of Christ, wishing you a very pleasant good day.